this morning, we're going to be in Romans chapter 1. I want to ask you to go ahead and turn there. And it's, um, today is going to be um, a tough subject, and, and, but it's here in the Word, so we're going to do it. And, but I, I want us to think about maybe that perhaps this being a, a, a place where you hear and understand exactly what you heard the band and the ensemble that is just sing about, that God's grace meets every single one of us. That, as, as we'll see, we'll get into 1 Corinthians 6 in just a, a little while, Lord willing, that it's really God's grace meets every individual, no matter their background or their current practice. So today, uh, you're, you're going to be looking at one of the, probably the highest form of literature in the book of Romans, but also probably one of the most hated texts in all of scripture. Um, we're going to be looking at sex, gender, uh, sexuality, and if your friend brought you to church for the first time, the ride home may be a little weird. <laughs> and uh, parents, uh, just know we're going to be dealing with some, some rough subjects here today, so just, if, if, you, if you have to w take your kid out, I understand. Uh, we've done this before, we've been through Genesis 18, we've talked about Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, usually the feedback we got was like, hey, that's exactly what my kid needed to hear. But, um, but let today kind of be a dad talk. Uh, if this is your first time, if you th this is your first time uh, coming, you, we do laugh a lot more. Uh, I, I do say some things that are funny sometimes, but not so much today. Uh, but this, let this be kind of a dad talk. And just know I love you. And just know that this is, uh, this is exactly where we are and what we need to hear today. So let's just begin with the Word of God. We begin in Romans chapter 1. Uh, and really I'm calling this when sex becomes uh, a religion. But really this is part one. Okay? <laughs> this is really about a three-hour sermon. But we've got, you know, Sunday school teachers got to do things today. So we're not going to go that long. Uh, but we're going to break this up uh, over the next several weeks. So let's stand together as we read God's Word. Beginning in verse 24 to the end of the chapter. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty for their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they knew the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word that it never changes, that it stood the test for eternity, but Lord, for the time that we have been around, on planet earth for thousands of years. God, thank you that we have a reliable source of information, of truth. And God, that this is also, um, it's medicine for our bones, for our hearts, for this society. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the truth and that someone today, all of us here today, there's not a thing that we haven't read here that doesn't apply directly to us at one time or the other or right now. So God, I pray that you would help us to see the cross, the blood of Jesus that covers sin, that gives, that ought, as we just sang about just a while ago, your great grace, that your favor extends to people every single day, that it can, you can save anybody at any point in time. And I pray that would be true of someone here today that's gathered or someone here watching um, online with us, God, that you would reach into where they are and draw them out. Well, we love you and we praise you again for who you are and what you're going to do. And no matter what lies ahead, 
for us personally, what, my, what, no matter what lies ahead for us as a country and this world, Lord, we say we trust you. We love you. And we'll, because of what you endured for us, Lord, we pledge our lives and give you our hearts and give you our minds. And we ask for the strength to not only just stay faithful, but speak into a world that is headed off a precipice. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is, um, thank you all. Uh, this, is, uh, this is urgent too, I would say, because of, of what I and you, many, many of you know to be true prophetically in Scripture. That um, what is, where we're headed as a, as a country, as a society, um, is something that's been written about long ago. That there are specific things that are written in Scripture for most, most importantly about, the, about Israel, about the people of Israel. That there is a time clock that they are on that we are on as well, but you won't see America mentioned anywhere in it. Which is alarming because we're such as a country, and for, especially since 1948, have been such a staunch ally with them. What I know the scripture says right now in Ezekiel 38 and 39, that Israel has no one to back them at the time when we look at it to be the end times. And you couple that with what we see here in chapter one of Romans and this pattern that I'll talk about here in a little while, where I'm very concerned about where we're headed, but at the same time, I'm a part of a monarchy. I'm a part of a kingdom. The one that won't be shaken, the one that's going to win. Uh, and many of you as believers in Jesus are as well. So I want us to, as we go into this, I know this is going to be rough, but we got to do this. Uh, because this, especially for you parents, grandparents, this is where your kids are. And they are on the front lines of it every single day. So I just want us to first off set some house rules um, and th- just to know where we're going. Uh, this is uh, going to be really good or really bad, really fast. So. Uh, but we're not going to back down. The first thing we need to look at as far as house rules is how we're going to go about the rest of this chapter for the next several weeks, really, is first off to look at truth. Truth, that the truth is biblical authority. And we have a responsibility to share uh, the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, verse 27. That's what Paul said. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. That means I'm not just going to tell you the parts I'm comfortable with, or the parts that my favorite celebrity pastor out there is putting out. No, we're going we're gonna to go through the whole word of God together. And today, I mean, if you think about, uh, you, know, you know, this past week, Twitter and Facebook have been exposed over and over again, but they're not exactly being, they, they, they tell you the truth that they want you to hear. And, they, and then they, they put out their fact checkers. The media does this. They put out fact checkers. And my question all the time is, why don't you let the fact checkers tell us the news? Right? I mean, that, that makes total sense. So, but yet we don't have that because we know that they all have an agenda. Whichever side of the political, whatever you're on, they all have an agenda and it's a managed agenda. And, that, and we also find out if, if you haven't seen The Social Dilemma, you can check, go check that. It's, cause it's a documentary, it's on Netflix. Uh, Social media is, t- and, and I know some of you, I, that doesn't affect me, wrong. Even if you don't watch it every day, it's affecting those around you. So it is affecting you, like it or not. And it, we're living in the matrix. Some of you get that reference, some of you don't. We're, we're living in a fantasy world, whether we realize it or not. And if you're just going to act all, I, I'm, I am an island to myself, then you, you, you actually do have to get on an island for this not to affect you. But truth is being attacked constantly and you're being told what they want you to hear. We, our authority is not what the government tells us. Our, our authority is not what uh, big tech companies tell us. Our authority is the word of God. And God's word has stood the test every single time. And it'll stand the, t- the test once again. Now, I won't tell you that I am, the, hey, I've got the corner or any of us have the corner on exactly what the Bible says. And I'll tell you every single time, don't trust this microphone. 
I'll tell you every single time, don't trust what I say. You, you look at the word of God on your own. And you, you talk to other believers. You, you go to others and, and other material in the Bible. You do like that, the, the, the Bereans in the, that were in Acts 17, 11 were more, uh, of more noble character, or more noble mind than the Thessalon- Thessalonian believers because they examined the scriptures to see if these things were so. In other words, they did their own homework. They did their own fact checking. We need to go th- this first off with that lens and that authority that the Bible is true. Secondly, we need to go with humility. Always recognizing that as with any sin, we approach it with integrity and humility. Humility meaning meaning that I'm more humble than you. That's not it. Humility meaning that I see myself in light of who God sees me as. That I'm a sinner, yes, a, a, a target of his grace, but I'm a sinner. That all of us, the list we just read here have the potential, if not the experience with this sin, of all sin. Adultery, out of place, anger, hatred, murder, liars, all of us. So before we go into this, know that we're not looking at somebody else. We're looking at ourselves in light of God's word. Next, we need to look at it with hope. House rule number three, hope. We, we approach this subject knowing that for some, the environment that we, in, we are in is all that some have ever known. So to hear these words can be tough, but we share the truth not to make people feel bad, because, but because we love you. And because we love you, we tell you the truth. Yeah, that make you, make you feel bad, but it's because hopefully, Lord willing, you're under what we call conviction, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. To be convicted is not to be I'm less than dirt. To be convicted means, no, I'm being led to the truth. So conviction is a good thing, not a bad thing. It's, it's kind of like, it's, what kind of doctor would a, would a doctor be if he didn't tell the folks that, yes, you've got cancer. Now I'm going to show you the treatment. Y'all, we've got soul cancer. We should feel bad about that, right? And we've got the great physician showing us the good news of the gospel, and that is hope. So for those who maybe this pattern of behavior, sexual sin, homosexuality, transgenderism, all the things that have been out there, we, we're not going to tackle all this in one sermon. We do have a book in the, in the, available in the back. Don't everybody go run and get it because we don't have so many. But it's a book by Sam Alberry called Is God Anti-Gay? We've had several Bible studies out of that in our church. And it's about a, a pastor who he gives a biblical defense of, of, uh, of sexuality from God's point of view. But he's also someone who, who, who struggled with homosexuality and has come out on the other side of it. Just, just know that and be, just be encouraged. Check that out. Um, so we approach it with hope. The fourth thing that we approach this with is courage. Courage. Most people are lost and brainwashed into thinking that sexual, sexual immorality is okay. It's not. Um, there are teenagers and adults who are here today. And I'll also say there are teenagers and adults who are not here today, who maybe knew where we were going, who embrace homosexuality or are contemplating it. Or maybe watching us on, online. Please hear the word of the Lord. Check out the book. Check out this book. Check out that book. Talk, have conversations with other believers. Don't just go into your own shell. But have other conversations with other believers. But know this. Hear the word of the Lord, but also hear the word of history. No world civilization has ever survived the open embrace and practice and endorsement of homosexuality. None. Every single civilization has crumbled under its weight. Because of the pattern, there's a pattern. There's a biblical, prophetical pattern that you see in Romans chapter 1. And every single one, there's three times God gives them over. Verse 24, verse 26, and verse 28. Every single time, every single, and every, every single uh, civilization thinks, hey, we got it figured out, we can do this better. No one has survived it. And again, this passage is one of the most hated. Barack Obama called Romans 1 obscure and irrelevant. 
when in, the, in his discussion of, of political embrace of homosexuality. And then, and then it goes into, into the dysmorphia of what we see now with, with uh, transgenderism. Joe Biden said this past week that a child ages seven to eight can identify and perform under them the, the practices of, of trans, 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 transgenderism. There's no way. No way no more that makes sense. They can't drive. They can't drink alcohol. They can't vote. Logically, tell, tell me how that kind of decision makes sense. And of course, not biblically. I know this is controversial. Yes, I know this is political. And yes, I know we're in a political season. And yes, I know we're all tired of hearing it. But we got to understand, that again, that we got to face this with courage. And yes, everything, everything is political. Right, Sherlock? Right? We shouldn't care about pleasing people. I know, I mean, I know I was, I was raised in that kind of thinking. And just know that right now, theology informs politics. It's never the other way around that politics informs theology. Theology informs politics. I heard Bill Maher this past week, and of course he has lots to say about the, um, about the Supreme Court justice and all this kind of thing, but Bill Maher is a uh, comedian slash uh, TV host, and he, he, he proclaims himself to be an atheist, and he said, you know, we should be, you know, we should be one, the, the atheists should be more represented because we represent 26% of the population, and I'm, I don't know if that's accurate, but that's what he said. And so, so we we're more equipped. Atheists are more equipped to decide things in in terms of the law and politics than anybody else because we don't have the hang up of the separation of church and state. And what he's saying in that statement is is that we don't have theology, so it doesn't infect our politics. Everybody has theology, even the atheist and the agnostic, and that theology informs their philosophy, which informs their politics. So this is not the time for us as Christians. First off, we, we need to engage those who have different views than we do, okay? And I know with the coronavirus, it's isolated people even more. We need to engage a lost world. And that means some of us need and some of us need to get relationships with those who may embrace a homosexual identity view. Or perhaps you already have some. And you're really and I, really right now, there's not any of us hardly anymore who does not have someone who's in our family. Uh, we've got extended family, cousins that identify as homosexual. Uh, you, there's people I interact with in, the, in Raven County all the time that are either homosexual, lesbian, or they, they embrace this view. So we need to speak lovingly but directly to them about this. And it will be, it will call you to have courage. 465 years ago, and this is nothing, I think we need to call on our historical figures, our, our past historical Figures that um, that stood uh, that took a stand for the gospel. These these two men, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer, uh, they were burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. And and yes, thank you. And merry old England. <laughs> yeah, we need, we got to have the kids to help break the ice. All right, four and sixty five years ago, last Friday. Uh, at the stake, I mean, it, he's, <laughs> I love this. Uh, Latimer said to Ridley, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light such a candle in England as I trust shall never be put out. I mean, both of them are being burned at the stake. And I was like, man, man up. Are you crying? <laughs> Sir, he's crying. We're being burned at the stake for Jesus, you know. A lot of us need to man up. And I love this from Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this, Christ became a man for you. Be a man for Christ. So 
And I know y'all are like, Joe, you haven't got the text yet. I've, I've tried, okay? We, we've, got, we've got to set these house rules. So just know that. We've got to have courage. We've got to have humility. We've got to have hope. We've got to have biblical truth. But next, let's kind of set the stage. And what I mean by that is go back through, I'm, I'm going to go back through some of my own history. That uh, those of you who are younger than me, which is more and more here lately, um, <laughs> You assume the world to be normative, like it's always been this way, but it's not, right? And I could talk to the boomers that were born the generation before I was, and they could, they could give you more testimony to it. But a massive social experiment has been underway in the last 60 years that has been cata cataclysmic. I was born in 1972, right? Man, those were some great years, right? I mean, we had great music. Anyway, but... The sexual revolution of the 60s had already rooted, rooted into our culture and into the classroom. The year after I was born was 1973. Roe versus Wade was legalized as abortion. It changed, it changed massively how the society viewed gender and sexuality. Until 1974, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, many, some of you may know what that is. You've, you've, had a, you've had a psych degree or whatever. But um, the, it's called the DSM. It's kind of the manual for, for psychology and for counselors. Listed homosexuality as a mental disorder up until 1974. Then along uh, 1990, uh, grew up in church, age 17, right after I graduated high, sc high school, I became a Christian. I became a believer in Jesus. And I, would, I, I, was not, I was not a moral man. I was not a, a moral teenager. I was not a virgin. I had surrendered myself to the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, all the while giving myself to church activity. This is, and I would, I would venture to say that was most of my peers. 1996, 1992, I thought the worst thing in the world happened was Bill Clinton got elected. Right, I mean, you know, I had to have that. You know, Jesus is still in control, you know, but he did a great thing in 1996. He signed the Defense of Marriage Act, which permitted, prohibited gay marriage. In 2003, Massachusetts legalizes same-sex marriage. In 2013, Supreme Court rules uh, DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, to be unconstitutional. In 2015, the Supreme Court recognized same-sex marriage as the law of the land at a vote of five to four. In 2010, the census estimated the population that claimed to be LGBTQ or to be 1% to 3%. I'm curious what people estimate to be now. I do know this. In this year, uh, uh, Gallup did a poll that people thought that 23% of the population was gay or bisexual. It's actually about 5%. Why the disparity? Because people are being told what social media companies, the entertainment industry want people to hear. And it's also now it's being embraced and endorsed by the business community. So no wonder this is, the society is being pushed into some type of precipice. And y'all, just before we do that, we're all on the same team, right? And right now I'm speaking of humanity. We're all sinners. You know, every 100% of us are sinners and 100% of us have a 100% chance of dying because of our sin situation and 100% of us need a savior. This is not the good people versus the bad people. Human history is the bad people, that's us versus God, Jesus. We are not gonna hammer one set of people so what we want to do today is hammer, and for the next several weeks, hammer all people because I believe in equality. This will be, some of you will catch it. The Bible equally ham, hammers all of us. So let's look at this. When sex becomes religion, what do we see happening? First off, the canaries in the coal mine. The canaries in the coal mine. Uh, this is God's wrath. Many, many of y'all perhaps are familiar with that idea that back in the day, or, or perhaps you've been on the mystery mine at Dollywood, you know what I mean? Um, but 
the canary in the coal mine was back in the day, the way that miners, when they were digging a hole, digging a mine, would know that they had, had come across uh, methane gas or any kind of dangerous gas, that the first one to be able to know it and tell it and get out was that the canary that was in a cage would, would be the first one to go, be the first one to die. And right now, in according to, to what Paul is revealing to us and the Holy Spirit has given us in Romans chapter one, the first thing you need to look at is what happens to a society that the canary is in the coal mine, that God's wrath is on, on a society whenever you see this threefold process take place. Again, in verses 24, or 25, 26, and 28. That there is a specific judgment that, that, that God um, reveals for denying him as one particular role, as, his, as the creator. Not as redeemer or sustainer or, or, or counselor or anything. There's a specific judgment of, of God that you see that, that is um, defying God as the creator. In other words, what it looks like is God saying, I made you, this is not what I made you for, so therefore I will let you have your way. Hopefully some of you will turn back to me. I mean, I told you last week, the worst thing that could happen in a, as a coach or in the classroom or anything else is when the coach or the teacher says, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not dealing with you anymore, I'm not yelling at you anymore, you just, you just go on. That's the worst. Verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. How? Through idol worship. And they go down these steps, we call this downward, this downward, this downward spiral of neglect, of fuzzy thinking, numbed emotions, isolation from God, idolatry. These idols. The, the, the worship of gods is, is this. The worship of gods who do not exist and the demons who do exist. That's idolatry. Let me say that one more time. It's the worship of gods who do not exist and the demons who do. We become like the gods we worship. Cold, heartless, nothing. So you see this first step of idolatry that it takes place. That idolatry is, leads to this coldness. But on the, on the other side, when we become like Jesus, when we worship Jesus, we become like him. We are alive, we're free, we're courageous, we're complete, we're everything. But idolatry, and I know some of us, I don't have any idols. I don't have any little Buddhas in my house or I don't have a, y'all, again, I, I know, but we do. Our idolatry is so te technologically sophisticated it's not even funny anymore. And I just, I found my, especially after I watched that documentary this week ago, how, how, many, how many of you, just a little, little, let me do a little social experiment. How many of us can put our phones down and not look at them for 10 minutes? It's usually the older generation. You're, you're right. Good for y'all. <laughs> how about an hour? How about a day? Some of us are liars. <laughs> Let's just repent right now. This is... <laughs> I really believe some of you can, okay? But if you can't put something down, anything, put it down and not look at it for an extended period of time. Yeah, and, I'm, and not just food or anything, but if, if you can't just put it down and not look at it and not devote time and money and treasure to it, then maybe you can say that's not an idol. But if you can't, I mean, that's, I've been, Lord, please, I mean, and the more, and sometimes the more we think about it, the, the harder it becomes. It's the law of, of it's, the, it's, the, it's the law of the law at work. So it starts with idolatry. You see that in a person, you also see it in a society. And just, Lord, is there anything I need to lay down here? The next part is that it leads to impurity or immorality. Uh, this is more dealing with a heterosexual perversion, not homosexual, but I told you we're into equality, right? So here you go, all right? Heterosexual perversion, lust, desire for what is forbidden. That's, that's what this word means here, this word impurity. 
Speaking of the overall condition, not necessarily, not necessarily a specific act, but a person's condition where their heart and their mind is, and it leads to impurity, a practice. So what are those practices? So what are the forbidden acts in scripture that are sexual acts that are, are forbidden? So I'm going to give you 10 of them. So I'll, you, you can write this down if you want, or we can put it online after we're done here and you can have it there. But first off, fornication. Um, th- this is uh, really the, the word fornication comes from our word, Greek word porneia, which we get things like pornography from. But uh, this is when s- just someone has sex either before marriage or anything associated with, with that. This is, you know, folks need to, you know, they're, they're shacking up or they're living together. They need to move out, break up, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it's sex that's outside of marriage before marriage. Uh, there's also adultery. Um, this is where you know, a married, married person or persons engage in sexual intercourse. But Jesus took it so much further, right? You know, he, he talked about hatred, that murder was just as bad uh, as hatred because someone hated someone in their heart. But the same thing applies and is true when he was talking to Matthew about, about lust. That it's not just the actual the act, but it's also the thought, and then you have things like polygamy. This is marriage to more than just one person. You know, yeah, this was our Old Testament dudes, right? Was it right? No. God called them out for it. But today you see even more things such, I mean, this is really where bisexuality is headed. More than one partner. Polyamory, which is multiple sexes, multiple people. Rape, this is when it's uh, engaged in sexual intercourse, it's forced. Clearly, it's, it's violence. Incest with a family member. Homosexuality, which we'll talk about here in a moment. The Bible, I mean, it's already a book, y'all. It speaks to bestiality. Sex with an animal. Prostitution, when you pay someone and, and again, that with, for, for the purposes of having sex. Sexual immorality. Again, this is this is the idea of pornea again. And all of us are right here. You know, Job 31.1, Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. And then lastly, pagan sexual activity. Now, this is the idea of, of some type of worship associated with, or that involves sexual practice. This would be uh, some, you know, just just cult-like things that we might think about today. But it goes back to the gods of Chemosh and Baal and uh, Moloch, and that would often be associated with child sacrifice as well. So that's again, it's it's the open. I'm going to worship this statue, this idol. And it's going to involve some type of sexual practice, but many times it involved child sacrifice. Uh, they, you know, Baal came all, all of them. They had a you know, bronze bull. Uh, this is the the, the society that uh, Ruth came out of that would offer their babies at the base of this bronze idol that had that was burning. They had a fire going there uh, to offer it up to this. God. It's te- I, mean, I, I mean, that sounds terrible, but how far separated is our society from that very thing? What Paul is saying is, hey, we're all guilty of all these things. And, when, and we can never forget that when it's outside of God's design, it involves the demonic. We're all guilty. But what does he say to do instead? Instead, immorality or impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints, Ephesians 5, 3 says. Colossians 3, 5, therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, for God has not called us to the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification, becoming more and more like him. Instead of engaging in this downward spiral, engage in the upward spiral of first off coming to know Jesus, knowing what he has to say, learning his word, loving him, enjoying him, seeking him, savoring him, sharing him, that's an upward spiral. That's what we're called to engage in. 
And real briefly before, because we're going to run out of time. Sex becomes a religion, not just when the canary, the canaries in the coal mine. If you go through that list of 10 I just gave you, that's where we are. When sex becomes a religion, people are corrupting their gift. They're corrupting their gift. You see, God gave sexuality, your sexuality, as a gift. It's his gift to you, along with all the other gifts that he's given us. It says that people give themselves over to degrading uh, passions. And why single out homosexuality? Because, again, it goes after God's place as creator. We've heard it in the 2000s. You heard it that from Lady Gaga and others that, hey, I was born this way. And now even the term sexual preference we heard in the Supreme Court uh, hearings last, last week, it was, it was being used a week or two before by those who embrace homosexuality, that now that that's a hate term. Because why, why would you say that someone prefers? They, they were born this way. No one has a gun to their head saying, this is my sexual identity. People prefer, they choose. What I want you to hear today is that, and of course, that's been the news, Webster changed the definition immediately because they didn't want to be singled out. You see, what we see is that it's not a sickness, but a sin. Homosexuality, bisexuality, all these things, LGBTQ, all of it is a sin. And this ought to be encouraging to us at the same time because we have a remedy for all sin. Scripture indicates that homosexuality is a sin for which everyone can recover. Turn real quick to 1 Corinthians 6 and we're going to have to be done here. I told you all this is like a three hour deal. We'll pick it up next time. You there yet? 1 Corinthians 6. So this, for anybody, any of us that are here today, and maybe, maybe you're struggling today, guys, maybe you're struggling with pornography. Ladies, maybe you're struggling with some type of sexual sin. Teenagers, teenagers today especially, that are, I mean, every time, you can ask them, every time they turn around, someone is saying that they are coming out as bi or whatever. So this is, this is a situation that we all need to, to be, not just be aware, but engage in, engage with our families and talk about it and do it in a loving way. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? I love this. Do not be deceived. Everybody say that real quick. Do not be deceived. We're being deceived, y'all. Let me take this one more place to a, a prophetic Passage, and that's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that says that things will get so bad that God will send upon us a upon the world a strong delusion so that people will believe what is false. I believe, I believe we're in the beginning stages of this. Strong deception. Picking back up. Neither the sexual immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now stop right there. Well, do we just single out homosexuality in this whole list? We got sexually immoral, you know, idolaters. I, I'm, not a, I'm not a slave to anything. Well, yes, you are. Thieves. How you doing on your taxes here lately? Are you reporting everything? Greedy, drunkards. Is there any substance that you are putting into your body, be it drugs or alcohol, that is more in control of you than the Holy Spirit? And then on top of that, are you ruining your testimony? On top of that, are you others who may have struggled with alcoholism or anything in the past, has, do they see you drinking and go, hey, I can do it too? Or are they looking at your whatever practices and saying, well, that's, if that's a Christian, then I don't want to be one. I mean, I'm, I don't want to, I'm, 
the point is not alcohol. The point is, is anything in, in, in control of you more than the Holy Spirit? Anyway, move on. Swindlers, all of us. But here's the, underline this, highlight this, put stars around it, emojis, whatever you got to do. And such were some of you. Everybody say that. Such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of Joey Thompson. And I could go around this room. This, this is every single one of us at one point in time was somebody on this list. And Paul is speaking to leaders. So there were former homosexuals who were now in charge of the church. That should give us great hope. And I know, I know this is tough, y'all. I know that there, there's a world out there that doesn't want to hear it. And we're going to be censored. We're going to be called out. Y'all, we need to go. For, look, I am a fellow struggle. I've struggled with all these things. And we need to say to a lost world, but I found the cure. We also need to tell them, hey, the canary is in the coal mine. It has already turned up, X's on its eyes, feet up, it's dead. We need to call the world to flee the wrath to come and become part of the fellowship of the redeemed and say, such were some of you, such were some of us. Come join us. We love you. Plead, and I would say plead. Plead with them. Not berate them over the head and do angry social media posts. Plead with them to flee the wrath to come. Come with us. There's a Savior who died on the cross to save you from every single sin, past, present, and future. And if you'll meet him today, like I did when I was 17 years old, in the middle of this cataclysm, you'll never regret it. Let's stand together as we pray. Jesus, we love you and thank you for the truth that never, ever changes. And Lord, um, give us resolve and strength today to trust you. And Lord, I, I, today there may be somebody here today who's struggling with some place in their life. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would cause them to trust you today, to see the God who, who loves them, that on the cross it was for them that he died to take their place, and that nobody, nobody, as long as they're alive, has um, been cut off from your grace, from, cut off from your love. Lord, call them to yourself, help them to see the truth and to see the Savior who loves. Speak to our hearts now as we sing together. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. We're gonna sing if God's calling you to make a decision to trust him for the first time or maybe be a part of this church family. Maybe you're just, hey, I need to pray. You do that as we sing.